one of the last surviving members of the basal Oedipoid group of Temnospondyls, Nigerpaton lived during the late Permian of the Republic of Niger. Although most Oedipoids were terrestrial, Nigerpaton seems to have returned to a much more aquatic lifestyle. It had a particularly large pair of fangs at the tip of its lower jaw, so huge, in fact, that it needed special holes in its skull for these fangs to fit though so it could actually close its mouth. Reaching about 40 centimeters long, Cacops probably fed on smaller animals, insects and pretty much anything else that would fit in its mouth, much like modern frogs and toads. Its well-developed ears and fairly large eyes suggest it may have been nocturnal, hunting at night to avoid the larger synapsid predators of the time. It had large bony osteoderms running along its back, forming a row of armor plating. As well as providing some protection, this would also have stiffened its spine and minimized side-to-side -side movement, suggesting it might have walked with a gait similar to modern crocodilians. One of the most bizarre-looking of the Temnospondyl amphibians, Platyhistrix is known from the early Permian. Although only partial remains have been found it seems to have been fairly large, estimated to have measured up to one meter in length. The neural spines of its vertebrae were highly elongated, fanning out as they grew and forming a distinctive flattened sail. Although many reconstructions show very defined skin webbing between each spine, they were actually packed quite closely together and may not have been quite so visibly separated in life. With a rounded frog-like head and a salamander-like tail, Gerobatricus has been nicknamed a frogamander, and it might be the closest known fossil relative of all living amphibians. Or maybe not, it's complicated. The problem is that for modern amphibians there isn't any clear scientific consensus on where they actually came from. The small fragile bones of Lys amphibians are only rarely found as fossils, and their modern anatomy is highly modified, making direct comparisons with extinct forms difficult. Zaytrikis had an unusually wide flat skull with serrated spiky edges, and seems to have been much more terrestrial than its larger relative Ariops. It is known to have have gone through a fairly dramatic metamorphosis from larvae to adults, larval fossils show rounded skulls with smooth edges, only developing their distinctive spiky shape as they matured. It also had a particularly large hole in the roof of its mouth at the front of its skull. This sort of hole is found in some modern amphibian skulls, where it holds a specialized gland that produces secretions to make the tongue sticky for capturing prey. One of the few prehistoric amphibians to be regularly featured in popular media, Ariops was one of the largest land animals of its time. Although it was semi-aquatic and probably fed mainly on fish, its particularly stocky build and stiff torso would have made it a poor swimmer. Instead, it may have been more of an ambush hunter similar to modern crocodiles. It also probably had a basic eardrum allowing it to hear sounds in air, which was impressive for the time, considering that many of the contemporary early synapsids were functionally deaf. Although this type of hearing system was once thought to be ancestral to all tetrapods, it now seems like it actually evolved completely independently four or five different times in different lineages. Dvinosaurus may have been partially neodynous, retaining juvenile characteristics into its adult form, similar to modern axolotls and mud puppies. Although some reconstructions also depict it keeping its external gills, it probably still developed internal gills as it matured. Many early tetrapods had a socket in the top of their skulls that would have held a functional parietal eye, a light-sensitive organ that helped to regulate hormone production and circadian rhythms. Some modern reptiles and amphibians still have third eyes, although not always as well developed as those of their extinct relatives, but they've been lost in mammals, turtles, crocodilians, and birds.
Hundreds of fossils have been found of Archegosaurus, from 15 cm long larvae all the way up to 1.5 m long adults, so we've got a very good idea of its life history and anatomy. Larvae had external gills and shorter blunter skulls, and as they matured they developed internal gills and lungs, and their snouts elongated into more crocodile-like shapes. Every life stage was fully aquatic, with very limited ability to venture onto land, and gut contents show their favorite prey was a canthodes fish. But despite how much Archegosaurus looked like a salamander croc, a detailed study of its physiology has estimated that its metabolism and body functions were actually much more similar to those of air-breathing fish like bichirs and lungfish than any modern amphibian. Platyoposaurus is a genus of temispondyl amphibian that looked a lot like a crocodile with a long snout. Like other temispondyls, Platyoposaurus would have been a predator, primarily of aquatic organisms such as fish and other amphibians. There has been speculation that the possibly gigantic Prionosicus from South America could be synonymous with Platyoposaurus, though since this claim was made in 1991, other researchers continue to list these genera as separate, though similar. Prionosicus was a temnospondyl that looked surprisingly similar to a crocodile, convergently evolving the same body plan tens of millions of years before the earliest crocodilians even appeared. With its long tapered snout, it particularly resembled a modern gharial, and probably occupied a similar fish-eating ambush predator niche. Most fossil specimens would have averaged around 2 meters in length, but one exceptionally large skull suggests that Prionosicus could get much, much bigger, possibly up to 9 meters long. This sort of size would make it not only one of the biggest predators of the Permian period, but also the largest known amphibian to have ever lived. Peltobatricus was a large, slow-moving animal, up to 70 centimeters in length. It was a fully terrestrial amphibian, only returning to the water to lay its eggs. To protect itself against predators such as the large Gorgonopsid therapsids, it had developed an armadillo-like armored plating covering its body and tail. The armor consisted of broad plates on the shoulders and hips and narrower plates on the rest of the body. Although no teeth of the creature have been found, it probably fed on insects, worms, and snails. Sclerothorax had some unusual features for a temnospondyl, a very rectangular skull with a wide blunt snout, and elongated spines on its vertebrae that gave its body a sort of humpbacked shape. It was part of a lineage of temnospondyls called capitosaurs, which mostly occupied the same sort of aquatic predator niche as modern crocodiles, but unlike its close relative Sclerothorax's well-developed spine and limb suggest it spent much more time walking around on land. Mastodonsaurus was a very large temnospondyl, growing up to 6 meters long. It's one of the largest amphibians known from actually decent remains. It likely lived similarly to modern crocodiles, lurking in waterways waiting for prey. In the water it may have done short chases after prey such as fish and other temnospondyls, but it probably ambushed tetrapod prey. Its limbs were quite small relative to the rest of its body, indicating that it likely spent most of, or even almost all of, its time in the water. It may have been able to attack animals on the banks of waterways, but that's probably the most it did on a regular basis, grabbing prey on the shore of the water and dragging it back in to be eaten. By the end of the Triassic, the temnospondyl amphibians had already been greatly reduced in number to what they were in the earlier Permian and Carboniferous. They were not all gone however, and some like Cyclotosaurus were without doubt flourishing. So far fossils have been found all the way from Greenland, across much of Europe, and even as far as. On top of this the largest individuals grew to over 4 meters long, meaning that large specimens were even capable of taking down early dinosaurs. Trematosauridae are a family of large marine temnospondyl amphibians with many members. They are one of the most derived families of the Trematosauroidea superfamily in that they are the only family that have fully marine lifestyles. 
long, slender snouts that are characteristic of the Tremetosaurids, with some members having rostrums resembling those of modern-day gavials. Living during the late Triassic of Colorado, Chinlestigophus had a skull showing a mixture of features shared with both Temnospondyls and modern Sicilian, providing a vital missing link in their evolutionary history. Previously the oldest known Kisilian relative was the Jurassic-aged Eochiacilia, which already had much more modified anatomy making it harder to definitively link to other known groups. It seems to have been part of the stereospondyl branch of the Temnospondyls, and an unexpected side effect of adding Sicilian into this group is that many Temnospondyls could now potentially also be classified as true members of Lysamphibia. Metaposaurus was probably entirely aquatic, with weak limbs that wouldn't have been able to support its own weight on land. It had a particularly stiff spine and couldn't undulate its body to swim, instead using flipper-like motions of its limbs to move around underwater. Large numbers of metaposaurids have been found in several mass grave sites, with fossils representing hundreds of animals in dense jumbled bone beds. These have often been interpreted as mass stranding deaths from droughts, but they may actually be the result of river currents carrying remains to a spot where they all accumulated over longer periods of time, with their actual origin being occasional individual deaths at large breeding gatherings further upriver. Gerothorax had an incredibly flattened body, upwards facing eyes, and kept its external larval gills even as an adult, adaptations for a life spent lurking at the bottom of rivers and lakes, waiting for prey to swim close to its huge mouth. Since laying flat would have made it difficult for it to move its lower jaw, it had to develop an entirely different way of opening its mouth. Instead, it lifted its whole head upwards in a motion that's been compared to a toilet seat. Following the Permo-Triassic mass extinction, stereospondyls are abundantly represented in the fossil record, particularly from Russia, South Africa and Australia. This led some paleontologists to propose that stereospondyls had sheltered in a high-latitude refugium that would have been somewhat shielded from the global effects of the extinction, and that they subsequently radiated from present-day Australia or Antarctica. A single partial skeleton discovered in the 1880 is the only known record of platyception, and represents a juvenile that would have been around 20 centimeters long. We don't know exactly what it would have looked like as an adult, but it was probably quite similar to other closely related members of the Brachiopid family, mostly aquatic salamander-like animals with short but wide toothy jaws, eyes set towards the front of the head, small limbs, and paddle-like tails. Stereospondyls like Xenobrachiops were particularly diverse during the early Triassic, with small-bodied taxa such as Lapilopsids and Lidecarinids that were likely more terrestrially capable present alongside larger taxa that would continue into the Middle Triassic. The vast majority of stereospondyls, particularly the large-bodied taxa, have been inferred to have been obligately aquatic based on features of the external anatomy such as a well-developed lateral line system, poorly ossified post-cranial skeleton and occasional preservation of proxies of external gills. Psydops was more than 3 meters long with a massive head and a huge jaw bristling with teeth. It was an ambush predator that looked like a crocodile. The skeleton is nearly complete and is one of the few vertebrates known from the Jurassic period in Australia. At the time of its discovery, it was the youngest member of my lineage, the Temnospondyls, which had been thought to have died out much earlier. New studies from Victoria show that related Temnospondyls survived much longer in Australia. Colosuchus is distinguished from other Temnospondyls aside from Cydrops by having the ramus of the mandible articular is excluded from the dorsal surface of the postglenoid area by a suture between the surangular and the prearticular and is distinguished from those two taxa by a lack of coronoid teeth. It inhabited rift valleys in southern Australia during the early Cretaceous. During this time the area was below the Antarctic Circle, and temperatures were relatively cool for the Mesozoic. Colosuchus likely lived in fast-moving streams. 
As a large aquatic predator, it was similar in lifestyle to crocodilians. Although Yusukians and kin were common during the early Cretaceous, they were absent from southern Australia 120 million years ago, possibly because of the cold climate. By 110 Maya, temperatures had warmed and crocodilians had returned to the area. These crocodilians likely displaced Colossuchus, leading to its disappearance in younger rocks.